The following is a production of the Dallas Genealogical Society. For more information, please visit our website at www.dallasgenealogy.org. Good morning, everyone. Welcome, and thank you for being here today. Our program this morning is Understanding Cemetery Symbols by Tui Snyder. She helps history buffs, genealogists, ghost hunters, and other curious seekers decode the forgotten meaning of the symbols our ancestors placed on their headstones. By understanding the meaning behind the architecture, the acronyms, and symbols found in America's burial ground, Readers will gain a deeper appreciation for the messages from the dead. And when I say readers, she's got several books. This looks very fascinating and interesting. And uh, we are very proud to have Tui Snyder with us today. She is very knowledgeable about uh, the topic and has done extensive research on um, this topic. She's a writer, a speaker, a photographer, and she specializes in offbeat sites, overlooked history, cemetery symbols, and haunted lore. Her award-winning books, including Unexpected Texas, Paranormal Texas, and The Lynching of the Santa Claus Bank Robber. She's currently working on several other books. That ought to be exciting. And... Um, including one about quirky and unusual burial sites. Will you help me welcome this morning, Tui Snyder. I'm not Tui. All right, let me play around with a microphone for a second. Okay. I think everyone can hear me probably. First of all, I want to say thank you to everyone. I know it was a little challenging getting here today. And of course, there's always something different you could be doing today as well. So I really appreciate you coming. And I want to thank the Dallas Genealogical Society for inviting me. And that wonderful, that was a very nice introduction. Thank you so much. And all the snacks. I don't know if you saw the cake out there. There's a cake that has little tombstones on it. I'll be sharing that on Facebook. I mean, that made me feel so welcome. Thank you. Uh, okay, so I just wanted to introduce myself again really quickly. Uh, my name is Tui Snyder, kind of an odd name. Uh, I write books. Uh, I give talks like I'm doing today. Writing books is my day job. This is kind of the fun bit when I get to go out and talk to someone besides myself and the cat. I also do a lot of research, and I'm sure you guys can relate. So today we're going to be talking about one of my favorite, absolute favorite topics to research, and that is cemetery symbols. And even though I wrote a book, it's something that I continue to learn about. And if you are the one of the people who bought my book today, please, I do have my email in there. I love hearing from readers. Uh, I love it when they send me symbols that I don't know what they mean yet. So there's that will be coming out in the second edition, right? So I also another, it's a real pleasure to be speaking to a genealogical group because I know that you folks understand where I'm coming from. And a lot of times when I give this talk, just generally to the to the you know lay public, whatever you want to say, uh, there's a few questions, a few hand raised. People are like, "Does your family think it's weird that you go to cemeteries? Why would you think that's fun? You know, things like that." And so when I come and I stand here, I know that you folks understand me. Now the reason I ended up writing a book is simply that I wanted a book about cemetery symbols. I had a book about birds, I have a book about plants, and I thought, yeah, well, I do historic research, I want to know what these symbols mean. And I just couldn't find a book that I wanted, so I ended up writing it. This is a very big topic, 
And I just want to warn you that even though I will be talking for quite a while, I could talk even longer. And <laughs> yeah, believe it or not. Um, but you're getting the Cliff's Notes version today. So if at times it seems like, well, she's just being a little breezy about this, she could be going into more depth and detail. It's simply because I am being a little breezy about this because we don't have time for me to plunge into all the depth and detail. And I'll, the other thing I want to say before I really get into it is uh, if you want a little clarity during the talk, you think of a question, don't save it for a Q&A at the end. I don't want you to have to try and remember that. I, that always bugs me. Just blurt it out, raise your hands. You might have to wave your hand around to get my attention. You know, set off flares, do something. Get my attention and I'll, if, if I'm talking too fast or there's something you want me to clarify, just let me know. So interruptions are welcome. Uh, I am focused on historic cemeteries. I do bring this up because I recently gave this talk and a woman came up to me afterwards and it, she said that she never saw any of the symbols that I was talking about in her cemetery. Well, as it turned out, it was a more recent cemetery from 1950 and beyond. She wasn't seeing, you will see some sem some symbols, but not quite as many. So I do focus, when I go to a cemetery, I just run to the oldest section. Probably genealogists do the same. <laughs> so um, There is a distinction, too, between historic cemeteries and modern cemeteries. And this is just a term I use to loosely describe cemeteries pretty much from the 1930s and before, I call those historic cemeteries. And that's where you're going to see more of the interesting uh, symbols that I'll be talking about today. And the reason I have this squirrel up there is to remind me, it's just a little example to talk to you about how symbols have changed. This is one thing that really surprised me when I was researching this topic, is we have become so literal in the modern age. Yeah, yeah, we use symbols. We use icons and emojis, but they are very literal. And let's say if your uncle died now and you needed to design a headstone for him, you might think, well, he liked tractors. We'll just put a tractor on the headstone. So it's very literal. Um, the squirrel here, I use it as an example because Let's say, you know, Aunt Madge on her, her cemetery, on her headstone, she might just have a little squirrel holding a nut because she liked squirrels. She liked to feed squirrels. But if this were 200 years ago, if you saw a symbol engraved on someone's headstone, that had a symbolic meaning. And what it means, it doesn't mean someone who had ADD as we kind of use squirrels today. It meant spiritual striving and holding an acorn because from the acorn grows the mighty oak. And so there is a whole big symbolic reason um, of symbolism behind it. And so I was very surprised to learn that in our day and age, we've kind of lost some of that poetic sense. So you've probably heard the old saying, all roads lead to Rome. Well, when I research historic cemeteries over and over, when I'm trying to puzzle out something and learn what it means, it seems like all roads lead to Greece. So this is my little private joke that now I'm sharing with you. Uh, in cemeteries, you'll see Greek influence. You'll see it in the vocabulary for cemeteries. You'll see it in the architecture. And of course, you're going to see it in the symbolism. So starting off with the vocabulary, Let's take a word such as taphophile. Some of you might know what this means. A taphophile. It comes from the word taph, an ancient Greek word which means grave or tomb. And then, you know, taphophile means someone who enjoys tombs. It's essentially a tombstone tourist or someone who enjoys going to a cemetery. I saw someone raise their hand. I was just going to say, are there any taphophiles in the house? Yeah, yeah. I have actually said that before, and like no one raised their hand. <laughs> oh, well. So another way that you see the Greek influence is in the word cemetery. It comes from an ancient Greek word, koimetrium, which if you speak Greek, sorry if I'm mispronouncing that. But koimetrium means sleeping place. Um, while we're talking about cemeteries, I want to say there is a difference, technically, between a cemetery and a graveyard. I mean, we do use them interchangeably. That's okay. But there is a difference if you want to be 
persnickety or, oops, sorry. <laughs> so a graveyard is when you have a burial ground that is affiliated with a church and right beside that church. A cemetery is when you have land, usually outside of town, and that's why they created them, was to get the, the bodies outside of a town. And this is land that has been specifically set aside for burial. And it might be affiliated with a lot of different churches. You might have the Presbyterian section and the Catholic section and the Jewish section. And so that is the big difference. Now the word cemetery, we use it all the time now, but it did not come into use until the Victorian age. Before that, you would have said burial ground, churchyard, graveyard. So keep that in mind when you're watching period pieces. It's kind of fun when you're watching movies and it's set in the Middle Ages or something and they're saying the word cemetery, you could kind of go, well, you know, they should have checked that. They didn't in fact check that. Uh, the reason for this is during the Victorian era, that is when the whole idea of death and eternal rest came about. That's when they started to think of death and compare it to sleep in all sorts of ways. You see this in epitaphs where it will say, asleep in Jesus, your resting place. This is when the idea of death and sleep really became intertwined. So they used, the Victorians did use sleep as a euphemism for death. So that's why the word, Greek word, you know, koimetrium, sleeping place, cemetery, now it makes sense. You will see this reference to sleep in the monument styles that you will encounter in historic cemeteries as well. Here's one that doesn't seem very obvious at first, but this is a bolster monument. And it's meant to look like a bolster pillow, like you might have at home on your sofa. I mean, to me, it looks incredibly uncomfortable, but that is a reference to sleep. This one's a little more obvious. This is at a cemetery town in Galveston. Oh, you take a picture? <laughs> it's so natural, right? Um, so yeah, so there was husband and there was wife and you can see the pillows and it looks a bit like a bed. This one's very sweet, very sad, very touching. I've got a very adorable epitaph on there as well. A child's grave and that little pillow. But I think this one wins for looking like the most comfortable <laughs> piece of stone out there. And this is over in Highgate Cemetery in London. And they did not even know this statue was there until they had a rather zealous gardener one day who was just going crazy with the weed whacker. And he was like, hey, I think I see a foot. And he kept going and he uncovered this beautiful resting angel. Yeah, isn't that beautiful? Another set of words that we tend to use interchangeably and we don't really think of them as having different meanings are the words coffin and the word casket. Uh, I mean, people just kind of interchange them, they don't think about it. The word coffin, the easiest way to remember what it means, for me anyway, is I think of Count Dracula. You've got, and it's a six-sided shape and it's called an anthropoid shape because it looks like a human. You can see where a head would be. It gets wider at the shoulders and then it gets narrow down at the feet. So that is technically a coffin and that is what people used until the Victorian era. We're going to get into that. That's when caskets came into fashion and there is a lot of fashion involved in cemeteries where you might not initially think of fashion in cemeteries but there is a lot. So a casket is a rectangle. It's a bed-like, it's very cushy, it has pillows, a lot of times it has a sheets in there. And this is another way that the Victorians were referencing sleep. Uh, a casket, before that, if you use the word casket, it meant a little jewelry box. So uh, you might come across that. Actually, I was reading an old uh, story and they mentioned she reached for her little casket and she pulled out a, a necklace. And that's, you might come across it now when you read old books. Surprisingly, the use, the introduction of caskets was met with some controversy. Many people really look down their, their noses at this, uh, such as this guy. That is Nathaniel Hawthorne, the great American author. He wrote such books as The Scarlet Letter. And in one of his essays, he actually railed against this idea. He didn't like people using um, coffins, I mean caskets instead of coffins, because he thought this was a, a euphemism. They're comparing it to sleep, they're not confronting death as they should. 
And so he said, caskets, a vile modern phrase which compels a person to shrink from the idea of being buried at all. Harumph. So, I don't know. <laughs> I pictured that was probably the next word. Another place you see the Greek influence in cemeteries is in the architecture. Here we have a table tomb. And you can probably guess why it's called a table tomb. It looks just like a table. And the reason for this is that back in ancient Greece, uh, when a family member would pass away and you would want to erect a monument in their honor, the first thing you would want to put up would be a table tomb. The reason for this was pretty simple. You needed a place to put the snacks when you came to visit them. And you were going to visit that grave quite often, several times a year for different ceremonies. And so, hey, you got your, I don't know, wine and grapes and cheese and uh, Greek grapes, whatever, Greek olives, whatever they would have in ancient Greece, and you needed a place to put it off the ground. So then the next thing, and, and we don't see a lot of these, I gotta say, it's a little disappointing. We don't see a lot of these in Texas. You will start to see them more if you go up the Eastern seaboard. Uh, but on the other hand, they tend to be some of the most precarious monuments. They're not very st um, sturdy, so be careful when you come across a table tomb. But anyway, the next type of thing that the ancient Greeks would want would be a bench. Because there you are, you've got your snacks on the table, you might want a place to sit down. So the next, this was an um, ancient Greek tradition that still carries through to today, is having a bench. Uh, here's a specific kind of bench that they had in Greece. It's called an excedra, which always makes me think of a headache medicine. It is kind of a curved style of bench. And you might see it when you see a painting of Socrates or Plato speaking to their students. And so the philosopher would be sitting on the excedra and their students would be, you know, crouched on the ground around them. Benches are still popular to this day. You, I like that little turtle bench. I think it's so cute. But yes, when you think about it, you really don't see chairs very often in cemeteries. Uh, even now, um, I spoke at a monument builders conference. They still design memorial benches, modern ones. So the bench, people don't really question it. You go to the cemetery, you see benches. But here is a tradition that goes all the way back to ancient Greece. And not to sound like Captain Obvious, but Benches are there for visitors to sit on. That's why they're there. Make sure it's sturdy. Don't be silly about it. You know, but they are meant, it's nothing sacrilegious to, if you're out at a cemetery and you choose to sit on a bench. That is the whole part of the tradition. Once again, all roads lead to Greece when we're talking about cemetery symbols. So when you see a column in a cemetery, uh, sometimes people will send me pictures and they'll say, too bad about all that vandalism, too bad, you know, it broke off. This is actually symbolic. This was built to look like a broken column. So when you are, I mean, there is, I'm not saying there isn't vandalism that does happen in some cemeteries, but when you see a broken column, that is usually an intentional reference, and it's just meant to mean a life cut short. Urns are a very popular uh, symbol that you'll come across, especially here in Texas as you go through historic cemeteries, and very common from the Victorian era. Um, this is because the ancient Greek soldiers, they were cremated and placed in urns. And, you know, it seems a little weird because the Victorians did not believe in cremation. This was not something they would do. But they were borrowing this urn and using it as a Christian symbol and it's just meant that as we came from the earth, so we return to the earth. It's an ashes to af ashes reference. Um, cremation, by the way, it was not popular in the United States until the last 50 to 75 years. And there's a reason for this. A lot of it ties into people's beliefs about Judgment Day. Uh, I have a good example. If you ever go over to Granbury, here's a good example there, but you will find it in other cemeteries as well. Now, at first glance, you would see these. These are some fairly small little box tombs. And so at first glance, you would probably think this is a row, like three infants. Uh, and you would only be partly right. The two on either side actually are for infants, but the one in the middle, 
I hope you can read it. You kind of have to squint your eyes. It's really hard to see, unfortunately, because of the lichen. But what it says is the arm, arm of W.H. Holland, amputated November 16th, 1895. And when I first heard about that, I thought, wow, what a character. I mean, who does that? But it is not an isolated case. This Holland, he was not trying to be silly when he did this. He was actually... Uh, wanted, well, oops, I went ahead a little bit. <laughs> oh no, you saw already. <laughs> okay, I'll let you see. This is not an isolated case. Larry and I went all over East Texas because we wanted to see the infamous leg of string fellow. This is a rather pricey monument. It's not cheap to get a nice monument. This, And you can see, I guess he has a little image of his leg right there and says, here lies his leg. So you might think, were these guys just practical jokers? What was the deal? Why did they do this? Well, it gets back to that whole idea of Judgment Day. And people at the time, they wanted all their parts. And so they thought when Gabriel blew his horn, they would get up, I guess they would get their leg, and they thought they were going to need their earthly body in the afterlife. Some people did think this. Uh, back then, in the Victorian era and before, there really there was nothing, there was no organ donation. If you got into a buggy wreck, you weren't going to donate your corneas or anything like that. In fact, there was a real stigma against uh, autopsy or organ donation. Well, not even organ, they didn't have it. But the whole idea of donating your body to science that we have today, this was not something they would do. And this was causing a problem because at the same time that people would think that only criminals would have their bodies donated to science, this is at the same time that uh, science was growing and there was a growing need in medical schools uh, to advance their knowledge through anatomy. And they, uh, needed, they needed bodies to practice dissections upon for their medical classes. And as a result, there was a problem with grave robbing in America in the 1800s. And there were quite a few interesting things they did to avoid this, like I've seen patents for exploding coffins and all sorts of things like that. So anyway, it's quite a, I have a whole bunch more about it in the book. There were even riots at that time. Uh, so if they found out that the medical college was using human bodies, um, some places they would come and burn the college. So all of that has changed. Now getting back to the urns, you might notice when you look at these urns, there's a slight difference on the cloth. One of them has fringe on the side, and the other doesn't have fringe. And first, so what? Whatever. Well, they mean something slightly different symbolically. So when you see the fringed side, that stands for the veil, or you know how we say, he saw curtains. So that is what that means. When there is no fringe, that stands for you shedding your earthly garments. So there's a slight little difference between the two. Here, I'll show you again. You can see. This one, and there's, they layer lots of symbols on here. So the one stands for, you know, as you can see, they've got the two different fringe. There's also, we have, um, a, it looks like a flame on the top to stand for eternal life. And it's really fun when you start to see how one item, at first glance, you might think, oh, urns, these are basically the same symbol but they kind of pile different symbols onto them and it becomes a little more of a puzzle and more fun to then try and decode each aspect of it. Now, an arch, this is a very common Victorian era symbol too. You will see these all over. And of course, they couldn't, they couldn't resist putting an urn on top of this one, as you see. Uh, the arch stands for triumph over death. And if you know anything about architecture, which I really didn't until I started writing this book. But you can't create an arch without a keystone. A keystone is what goes in the center up at the top. And it's shaped like that on there, that little, I don't know, that's a keystone shape. And I really love this one because here they have, it's basically symbolically saying that you can't have the strength to triumph over death without making love your foundation. And you will see different things sometimes in the keystone. So when you do see an arch in a cemetery, go over and take a look and see what they put inside for their keystone. Sometimes they will have a crown to say the kingdom of heaven. 
so other times it might be a heart in there. So there are different ways that they can add to a symbol. Whenever you see a sheaf of wheat, that's a very nice one. It usually means the person lived to be at least 70 years old. They lived to a ripe old age, achieved their potential, the final harvest being death. Flowers are a very common symbol throughout a historic cemetery. And actually, I could just give a talk just on flowers because there are so many. Um, I'm not going to because I'm just giving you the overview, as I said. But when you do see flowers on a headstone, uh, pay attention to what stage of the plant's life it is in. So children, you will a, a little baby or a child, you will see quite often a little rosebud, and it, it will be broken. If someone lived longer, it might be slightly open. And if someone reached the full bloom of adulthood, as this one here, you see there's a, a, a rose. Now be careful that um, if you're a botanist or a gardener, don't expect the plants to be perfect <laughs> renditions of how they look in real life. Uh, you know, here in Texas, when I see leaves of three, you know, I'm thinking poison ivy, right? <laughs> in the cemetery, it's a reference to the Holy Trinity, and a lot of plants that may not have three leaf patterns in your garden are going to in a cemetery to represent the Holy Trinity. And there's just a lot of poetic license. Sometimes I just cannot tell what the plant is, but and people will send me, we'll try and figure out, we'll talk to a gardener, and it can take a little, little bit of, um, that could be a challenge. I've got to ask, are there any Star Trek fans? <laughs> all right, all right. <laughs> Yay, me too. That's why the first time I saw this on a headstone, I thought, what? Does this guy just really like Star Trek? What is going on? And then I saw, wow, he passed away decades before the show came on. I'm a little confused. Well, when you see this on a headstone, it is a reference that will be in the Jewish section or the person uh, means they were Jewish and that they descended from the tribe of Kohen. Kohen means priest. And so it's, this is it. This is the priestly blessing. Um, now, Leonard Nimoy was Jewish, and he had seen people in his synagogue making this sign, and so when he was developing the character of Spock years later, he just incorporated this into it. It's a little surprise for us all. Now, hands, surprisingly, are a very big topic. In fact, I have a whole chapter in my book called Hands, Hearts, and Body Parts, um, <laughs> because there is just so much to it. Now, I want to tell you, in this next section, I see a few people taking notes. You don't have to worry about taking notes here if you don't want. Um, I do have a handy hand handout. If you go and visit my website, you sign up for my newsletter, and you'll be sent this PDF file that gives examples of the hands I'm talking about here and even a few more, I think. So hands pointing up. This is a common theme you will see on headstones when hands are pointing up stands for one going up, going to heaven. So that's a good thing to see. This one says, I think, yeah, gone home. All right. So then you see, uh-oh, <laughs> what's going on here? Do, do, should I ask? This is not quite as dire as you think. However, it does represent the hand of God. And this is a hand, or I've heard it described as the fickle finger of fate. This usually refers to someone who died suddenly. So maybe they had an accident or a heart attack or something happened. So this is just a sudden death. And those little bubble-like things that you see around there, that stands for the clouds, that stands for heaven. Uh, I included this one because we saw her earlier. Uh, even if you hadn't seen the name yet and you see this hand holding the full rose, you can kind of guess from a distance, I bet that's going to be a young woman. You can go over, and so if you were doing some genealogy, you might try to find out why did she die suddenly. Maybe she died in childbirth. We don't know. Handshakes are really fascinating, and I love it. It's one of those things about cemetery symbols where you think, oh, a handshake, it just probably means one thing, and then it ends up being so much more to it. So I want to say here, when we look at this handshake, look at the tight grip versus the limp fingers. You want to keep that in mind. So here we are facing the headstone. Generally speaking, when you're facing the headstone, um, the hand that's on the right is either a relative 
or it's God, or maybe someone from his club, a fraternal handshake, which we'll see. Um, so that one is in heaven. They're welcoming this person to heaven. And so that's why they've got the tight grip. They're like, hey, bud, welcome. The loose fingers are because you've just passed away and you're being pulled into heaven. Now, this is a different type of handshake. I just call this the marital handshake because sometimes you will see a handshake that is meant to represent the husband and wife. And this one is over in Weatherford, and they went to town on this one with symbols. Usually it's just the handshake. And when you look at these handshakes, you want to see if you can tell if one hand, first of all, by the names, okay, there's a man and a woman, husband and wife, or a man and a woman here. And then, oh, I guess they're husband and wife. You look at the hands. They both got a fairly tight grip, although it's a little hard. Her hands are so small here. Um, but if you look at his cuffs, you can see that's very masculine clothing he's got on. She's got very feminine clothing. Uh, they've done some other things to let us know that they are married here, too. They have tied the knot. It says Semper Fidelis, which I don't think they were in the Marines. I think this is <laughs> meaning they were faithful. Uh, so there's, they've, and they've got the little heart on her bracelet. So there are a lot of interesting things. In fact, I don't know if you guys have ever heard of the vein of love, but I think this is really fascinating while we're talking about wedding rings. This was the uh, Romans believed that there was a special nerve or, or vein that went from your, your fourth finger and ran up to your heart, which is pretty interesting because you think when people have heart attacks, sometimes the pain comes down and radiates down this way, and they called that the vein of love, and that's one reason for wearing the ring on the fourth finger. All right, but the marital handshake. There's more handshakes. I'm not done with them. This here is a Masonic handshake, and you can tell because, all right, so you look at the one on the right. He's got the tight grip, so he's welcoming his fellow Mason to heaven. He's got his finger out, the index finger, and uh, he's welcoming his you know, fraternal brother to heaven. Now, this is an interesting one. Both of the fingers are extended, and both of them have a nice, firm handshake together. So what's going on here? Well, it took me a while. One day, I kind of noticed the similarity, and I thought, oh, so if one finger out, you know, means uh, stands for someone who belongs to the Freemasons, the Masonic Fraternal Order. I'm sure you guys are familiar with that. Um, then maybe the husband was a member of the Masons and the wife was a member of the female auxiliary or the order of the Eastern Star. So isn't that neat? And when taken together, when they have that handshake, it looks like the compass and square symbol, which you have on the right, which is a very well-known symbol for the Masons. I could go on about hands, as you see. And it's so, you know, next time you go to a cemetery, take a look at the hands. While we're talking about fraternal organizations, let's dive into this a little bit. In the 1800s, there were over 2,000 fraternal organizations and clubs of all types in the United States. And I'm not going to tell you all of them, but there were quite a few. Uh, people would join these clubs, and they served a certain a lot of purposes for them. One thing, some of these clubs offered benefits, death benefits, so they would provide a headstone for you or there's some sort of life insurance for your spouse. Some of them were for networking purposes. Um, some of them were just for fun. There was one called uh, the Order of the Big Dogs, and in order to be a member of the Big Dogs, you had to play a musical instrument and you had to weigh over 200 pounds. And they met, they didn't meet, like, their clubs. They called them kennels. And so this was primarily, yeah, they had a lot of funny. I'm like, these guys are funny. I was really hoping they had some sort of death benefit and I could find their symbol. But as far as I can tell, they were primarily a music and drinking club. <laughs> but people would do, they wouldn't just belong to one club. So that's why sometimes people uh, will be confused. They're like, why is this person a mason and an odd fellow and well he was an odd fellow well, you know what i mean a lot they belong to several different groups it's because they get different benefits from each group so if you could belong to two or three groups why not woodman of the world they they make some of the most eye catching headstones that you'll see especially here in texas and throughout the south they incorporate a tree of life and they have a lot of other symbols on their trees yeah 
it, it, she's asking if they still are, do have Woodman of the World. They are still active. There are, now that they're on my radar, I've seen them. There is one, I live in Hazel. There is a little, uh, a small, you know, Woodman of the World that caught my eye. We were driving by, it's like in a strip mall. It's not very palatial. Now they did get rid of their death benefit. So if you are a member of the Woodman of the World, uh, now you're not gonna get one of these fancy monuments like you used to. And this is one of those ones where if you like puns, you can really go to town on Woodman of the World because Joseph Cullen Root is the man who <laughs> created it, and they have a lot of splinter factions. Sorry, but um, they do. I know, it's, it's terrible. I'll stop myself, okay. But you will see trees sometimes. You can't assume, now here in the South, pretty much 90% of the tree stones that you will see are from the woodmen of the world. But occasionally, you will see a tree stone that isn't a Woodman of the World tree stone. And that could just be um, just representing the tree of life. So if it doesn't say there's Doom Tosset Klamat on it and have some of the other things on it that a Woodman headstone would, then you know it's just a different one. Now, I'm sure everybody in this room knows what this is all about. But at least once a year, I get an email from someone who's a little freaked out wonders, was grandma a witch <laughs> kind of thing? Um, this is an acronym, FATAL. I mean, it sounds so dire. We're in trouble right there. Oh my gosh, FATAL, and it's an upside down star or a pentagram, oh help. Um, so FATAL stands for fairest among 10,000, altogether lovely. And I did mention the female version or the female auxiliary for the Freemasons earlier. And this is a one of the symbols for it, this, so if you see this on someone's headstone, then they most likely were a member of the Order of the Eastern Star. And this is just uh, full of beautiful symbols. Uh, first of all, there's that lovely acronym. And then each uh, ray of the star there has a different symbol inside of it. And those all have to do with the different aspects of womanhood. So there's being a daughter, being a sister, being a wife, being a widow, things like that. Um, we don't have time to go into that, but I just think it's a really fascinating one. And I have to bring it up because, of course, I wrote, thanks, Hollywood, because uh, people see this. It's used a lot. Anytime you see a star in a movie, you know, someone's going along and they see this written on a wall or something. Oh, no, you know, Satan is involved or there's something dire. Someone's a witch. Something's awful. That is really not going to be the case when you are in a historic cemetery. Here's another acronym that people bump into in a historic cemetery. This one is really clunky, not as easy to remember as the catchy fatal. This one is, I have to look, H-T-W-S-S-T-K-S. -S -S -S. And that stands for Hiram Tyrion Widow's Son Sent to King Solomon. And this is another Masonic emblem. Uh, when you see this, now that shape might look familiar to you because I was talking about keystones earlier. That is a keystone. And so when you see this on someone's headstone, you know they were a, ro a royal arch mason. And they study the story of Hiram Tyrion's widow son sent to King Solomon and how he, um, the trials and tribulations he went through. That is one of their um, things that they learn about. So. I want to be careful how I word all this because whenever I write anything about Masons on my website or whatever, I you know you get very detailed responses saying you didn't quite say this right, but there you are. I had to include this one. This is not a common site that you will see. I saw this down in New Orleans, and this is called a tumulus. It is an a tumulus is a, a burial mound an ancient burial mound used for warriors, like Viking warriors. In fact, I just read, you might have come across this article too, they just like last week, they discovered some anthropologists in Norway went up a fjord somewhere and they discovered some tumuli, <laughs> they discovered some ancient warrior mounds and uh, actual Vikings. Now, I, I kind of wonder who mows this thing, getting off the subject there, but in this case, this symbol was, oh, and I want to say, so whenever you see a Viking movie and you know how when the main Viking dies and they shove him off to sea in the burning boat, blah, 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 
Once again, thanks Hollywood, that's not what would happen. They buried them. They didn't shove them out to sea in a burning boat. They wouldn't waste a nice boat. But what they would do is they would, the heroic warriors, they would make a tumulus, which is a, a mound like this. Now, this one doesn't have ancient warriors in it. This one has members of the benevolent and protective order of the Elks. So the Elks Club down in New Orleans has quite a grand monument. Um, they got the elk up on top there, and then you might notice too, they have that clock that's set at 11 o'clock. That is because if you are a member of the elks, at 11 o'clock is when you raise your glass to your fallen elk brothers. So that's the meaning, oops, sorry, the meaning of 11 o'clock. All right, here's your history lesson, everybody. In 1798, Napoleon invaded Egypt. And he brought back all sorts of really interesting, you know, after r ransacking the country, he came back with some really interesting artifacts. And we have been fascinated, the Europeans were quickly fascinated by that. And it is just, I mean, Egyptian symbols are pretty fascinating. It's been trendy ever since. The Christians borrowed the Egyptian symbols. Uh, you might have noticed I've been, I've been talking how the Victorians borrow ancient Greek sy symbols. Well, the Christians, by the same token, they borrowed these Egyptian symbols and they adapt them to their own beliefs. So here we go. Now, obelisks are one uh, symbol that we have borrowed and you will see a lot. Think of the Washington Monument. Our founding fathers were quite interested in that. Um, in the shape of the obelisk, it dates back to the worship of the sun god Ra. Now, does that mean that our founding fathers worshiped the sun god Ra? No. When we borrow symbols from other cultures, we adapt them to our own belief system. So uh, for Christians, when they, when they borrow the obelisk, they are using it to show the connection between heaven and earth, it's a, a symbol of power, of strength, and fatherhood. Uh, you will often see an obelisk uh, in the center of a, a family plot. Like, you'll see them quite often in Texas, and so it might just have either the, the patriarch's name on it or just the last name, uh, and then you will have the headstones of the rest of the family. That's kind of a common, I mean, people can change these as they wish, but that is a kind of a common theme you'll see. You don't see a lot of pyramids in Texas, but I had to throw this in. I saw this down in New Orleans, and who doesn't love a good pyramid? I mean, it stands for eternal life. A sphinx is also an, a, a fun symbol. Um, it stands for wisdom and strength. Now, you will see some Egyptian revival uh, images or architecture in Texas. You have to look a little more carefully. Uh, for one thing that's kind of a clue when you first glance at this is that the, the door goes straight across because the Egyptians hadn't figured out how to make arches. So that's uh, like a clue from a distance. Like maybe that one is going to have, if you're walking through a historic cemetery and you see a, a mausoleum with a, you know, a non-arched door, you mean, hmm, maybe that will have some Egyptian uh, symbols to it. Now if you look over, look over the doorway, you can't quite see here. I'm going to I think in the next one I do, you can see uh, a very interesting symbol. This is vulture wings. Uh, so vulture wings are, are a fascinating symbol to me because to the ancient Egyptians, vultures were a sign or a symbol of motherhood, which, you know, we don't tend to think of that. We, the, the vultures, they don't get the respect, <laughs> that sort of respect in the modern area. We think of the trash men of the world or this or that. But the, they had a reason for this. Uh, and I've got to say, in my book, I do try to figure out the reason why things mean something. For instance, uh, ivy. Why does ivy mean friendship? It's because it clings to you the way your friends should. They will stay with you. So I was thinking, what on earth do vultures have to do with motherhood? Well, when a vulture is born, they actually, it takes them quite a long time to become self-sustaining birds. And the, the vulture parents have to do a lot to nurture. It's like it's over a year or a year and a half before they can fledge and live on their own. It's not like sparrows and the smaller birds where they just sort of crank out three or four, you know, nestlings and they're just, hey, after two weeks, oh, go on your own, kid. It's different. 
So to the Egyptians, they observed this, and I thought, oh, that's a good symbol of birds that truly care about their young. And so it, vultures came to be a symbol of motherhood to them. Now in the center, that disc there, that's a reference to the sun again. And the sun god Ra, uh, without the sun, we wouldn't have much going on on our planet. So to the ancient Egyptians, the sun stood for fatherhood. So when you combine the vulture wings and then you put that disc in the center, you have a symbol for family. And so it's over the door. So keep an eye out when you are in a historic cemetery and you look above the door. Lotus-topped columns, this is another Egyptian symbol. Uh, the lotus blooms during the day and closes at night. And so that's a symbol of the afterlife and resurrection. I have a whole chapter in my book, Saints, Angels, and Other Beings, because it is fun once you start to get into this. And if you are lucky enough to find a historic cemetery where there's a lot of statuary, it's kind of fun to figure out who these different beings are or what they are representing. So here are a few that you might find. The angel Gabriel is usually easy to find. Just look for him. He'll be holding a horn, a horn he'll blow on Judgment Day. Father Time is not a very common figure, but he's an older gent who's usually twiddling his beard. Often he'll have uh, things with him, maybe poppies nearby, or he will be holding a, an hourglass, have some sort of reference to time. Faith, here we have a beautiful angel. She's just a praying angel. Michael, Archangel Michael, is uh, dressed as a knight, and he has a sword. Sometimes he'll be slaying some sort of devil or dragon kind of beast. Now this is uh, called a recording angel. This is an angel who is writing down your deeds in the book of life. And so she's just got her book there. She's keeping notes. I'm fond of them since I take so many notes. I love a recording angel. Now there's another meaning here that is easy to miss. Uh, because it's a bit subtle. The Victorians were, uh, they were, you know, I don't know what the word is, prudish maybe, I'm not sure. But she has her hand over here because uh, it stands for charity. And if this were a painting, you might see she might have a bare breast or she might actually have a child there nursing it. Um, and so, but the hand here is just a subtle reference from the Victorians to say charity. Now here's another uh, reference with the hand. We have an angel and the hand's up here. You might just think, oh well, the artist simply wanted that as a pose. But this stands for sacrifice. And I remember that by just thinking of like, you know, kind of. <laughs> so that's what that's what that represents, sacrifice or martyrdom. Now here we have a mourning angel, and there's all sorts of symbols going on. There's that, the life cut short, and she's grieving. She's got a palm leaf for resurrection and lilies for purity. So it is, once again, this is one of those instances where they, it's really fun to find a monument where there are all sorts of, uh, more than just one symbol piled on there. Remembrance. Uh, whenever you see a circle like that, a circle, a wreath of flowers, um, that stands for eternal remembrance. Some saints, it, it does get tricky. There can be some that look quite a bit alike. I have a hard time sometimes at a glance remembering Saint Joseph and telling him apart from Saint Anthony. Um, Saint Joseph, you can tell because he has a beard and he has the hair. It's, you gotta look for the hair and the clothes on this because they both have baby Jesus with them. They both have lilies, which represent the Virgin Mary in this case. And so, it, you know, who are they? So St. Joseph, he's the one who will have the beard. And St. Anthony, he will have the monk-style haircut, you know, the shaved hair up there. Um, he's also holding a Bible because um, baby Jesus appeared to him while he was reading a Bible. But sometimes there's little subtle differences at first. It's hard to tell them apart. Uh, I want to talk about hope. And it's interesting because this, you can tell a few things going on here. The reason I call her Hope is because she has an anchor. And anchors, when you see them on a headstone, they rarely have to do with sea captains and sailors. 
Now, of course, if you were down in a port town, I think we were down in Biloxi, Mississippi, and there were quite a few anchors there that were, you know, sea captain so and so, or people who were related to fishing. So, you know, context is important here, but the anchor actually stands for hope, and there's a reason for this. Um, it does stand for, oh, I thought I had a different slide there. What am I saying? Well, all right, so anchor stands for the, your faith in solid foundation, and this is a Christian symbol. It's actually an ancient Christian symbol. I'm sure you've probably seen the one on the left there, the fish, the kind of crude fish, the simple one. I mean, you see that, at, I see that on bumper stickers. I've seen that since I was a kid. And that is a secret symbol that the Christians would use during times of Roman persecution. However, believe it or not, the anchor pre predates that. And uh, uh, it was probably a little more stylized than the one I have up there. But that was um, the anchor is an earlier symbol than the fish for um, Christians when they were meeting during times of Roman persecution. Uh, well, time flies. I love that. Isn't that great? We've got wings. You've got the, the hourglass and all that. Uh, it really, as you can see, there's too much for a talk. Every time I give this talk, I kind of go different directions with it because there's just so many fun things to chat about. Uh, we could talk about, I could probably talk about crosses all day if you wanted. Um, so there's just so much to it. Uh, and and as you, I hope you guys had as much fun as I did. Now, before we go, I want to say I'm not Oprah, but if you look under your seat, there are three seats that have um, my business card with taped to it. And whoever you are, the lucky three winners. <laughs> Oh, okay, I'm not the one who taped them, so I don't even know where they are. I'm just excited, woof, woof. So whoever has those, and look around on a chair that so you're not sitting in. <laughs> I have um, your choice of a graveyard journal, which is a journal for people who like to go to graveyards like we do. Um, my, my book, Paranormal Texas, which is a travel guide. Oh, is there one? <laughs> oh, you're the only one, woo -hoo! All right, so we got one down. Yeah, wait till I'll find them, then I'll tell you what you won. Oh, thank you so much for doing that. Like, you know, I like to give a few things away. I wish I could just go, hey, you all get this and that. And, oh, you got one? Okay, one, two. And did the third one get found? You just come up to me after the talk, and you will get a, your choice of one of these books. I've got um, two of them are workbooks, the one on the side. One is for people files like us who visit a lot of historic cemeteries and you that way you can take little notes and then later when you're thinking where was the one that had those good pecan trees I want to go back or where was the one that had this symbol you know that I because I see so many cemeteries sometimes I can't remember where this or that is uh, the other one is on the right is for ghost hunters so you've got a ghost hunter in your life that can be a good gift for them make to make them take notes I think everyone should take notes uh, and then the one in the middle is my book that just came out. It is a travel guide to haunted places in the Dallas-Fort Worth area, maybe someplace near you. So that's the fun bit. So everyone, there was all three you guys got? Okay, so that's it. I just want to thank everyone. If you have any questions, you can always email me or come and talk to me. Oh, yes, hi. Oh, okay, everybody. We're going to reopen the room. Good, because I want a piece of that tomb cake that looks really good <laughs> and come and say hi all right and ask questions and like I said drop by my website and if you find an interesting symbol when you're out and about I do love hearing from people and if I don't know what it means I will see if I can't find out so thanks again you guys are wonderful to talk to <laughs> this has been a presentation of the Dallas genealogical society if you're already a member Thank you. Your membership dues are supporting this and other society activities. If you're not yet a member, I hope you consider joining. You can become a member for as little as $35 a year, and you can join by going to our website, dallasgenealogy.org, and clicking on the Membership tab.